Hey, everybody, just wanted to welcome you to the December edition, the 2023 edition of the Neural Audio Programmer podcast. And I'm here with Christian Steinmetz and Andrew Fife, And we're here to talk about some of the uh, latest changes, latest breakthroughs that have happened in AI and audio. And um, maybe one way that we could start out is just by talking about some of our favorite uh, developments that we've seen in the field. Obviously, this year has been a heck of a whirlwind for us uh, and for the industry. And I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on uh, what what you've seen this year. Some of your uh, some of your favorite breakthroughs. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so many. So <laughs> there's been so many like uh, break, breakthroughs this year. Um, yeah, like uh, we, were, we were chatting a little bit before the uh, we went uh, live with the video, and uh, yeah, I think uh, what you said, Christian, about acceleration is definitely something that's uh, just we're seeing more and more of, like every year, um, and significantly in the last like couple years, it's just it's just got exponentially uh, faster, and how much stuff is like coming out. Um, so, I mean, for me. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of like text to music stuff, text to audio. That seems to be something that's like a major interest to to some people. Um, but for me, I guess like uh, I'm more interested in like some of the um, I guess plugin specific technologies that we're seeing and some of the real time research. I think um, you know the release of um, so we're, we're we're familiar with the the rave and the sort of variational uh, auto encoder stuff um, that we saw that came out sort of in previous years but that's been continuously getting better and um sort of rave has been getting more and more mature and the timbre transfer technology uh, of like converting sounds to another kind of sound in real time has been getting uh more and more um i guess like a uh, um yeah higher in quality and fidelity and um, so that stuff's been interesting also, also like the parameter control um sort of automation side like um ai mixing and things like that with like simplant so like automating um the synth parameters to achieve certain sounds like the simplant 2 release um the other month uh i think was uh, made huge like shock waves in the sort of plugin worlds and um you know turned a lot of heads to what's going on uh, and showing a lot of potential so um i think they're probably my two favorites so like probably that yeah some of the ai mixing stuff uh, that you're seeing with like plugins like Simplant and then also some of the Tomber transfer technologies that are continuously improving as well. Um, but yeah, Christian, what's your what's your thoughts? Yeah, definitely a lot of the similar kinds of feelings. Like it's, I mean, for me, 2023 was definitely like the year of music generation in some sense. Um, like this stuff has been around for a while. And, you know, I was kind of reflecting a little bit on the original WaveNet model from 2016, which was in some sense, I think what kicked off a lot of the interest in like audio generation or music generation with machine learning, um, you know, back in 2016. So a number of years ago, and that's actually like the paper, one of the papers that got me interested in this field. Uh, and, you know, their original, like really impressive demo was they were doing speech, but they also had trained it on some piano, solo piano. Um, and you kind of was like one of the first models that could actually like generate some coherent sound on the order of a few seconds that like sounded like a piano and I was kind of thinking on that and then you know clearly at that time people that saw that or worked on that like saw the potential of it but since you know I don't really feel like until this year did that like idea actually reach the masses to some degree you know and now we're seeing like all these different text to audio and music generators you know come out both from academia like meta open sourcing theirs and then also you know a bunch of commercial options that are emerging and a bunch of startups and businesses that are trying to build on this same idea that people were kind of like, that's never going to happen or it's going to take forever to build it. So it, to me, it definitely feels like there's a lot of momentum happening there and like a lot of players in the field, which to me is really exciting because when you see that kind of, you know, growth in the space as people investing and like putting effort into it, it's likely that, you know, we'll keep getting better and better results. Um, so that's really excited for that, especially looking forward to next year. You know, if this is what we got in 2023, I imagine it will be even better by next year. Um, but also on the other side, I think there's a lot of stuff um, that is that that you mentioned, Andrew, that I also am a big fan of. Like there, there is also kind of this view that like maybe music generation 
for AI is like the one, it's like one big thing in, in music, but it's definitely not like the only thing that's going to have impact. And the thing that's kind of been much slower, much more slowly developing is kind of like tools that sit very close to people that are professional music creators and stuff like plugins, like you mentioned. Uh, and I think we're definitely starting to see like more movement there in, in like getting tech into the hands of musicians, um, like those like with the work with Newtone, but also like other plugins that have come out this year. Like I think also about like the Lander plugin they have now, right? Like taking their like really well established AI service and putting it into a plugin that uh, works inside of DAW um, is another kind of cool thing. And then like the neural audio plugin competition, I think also marked some starting point there of people. Uh, you know, making an effort to take this kind of tech that's come from the academic side that's been hard to get into plugins and like actually build real things uh, from that. So I'm, ho I'm hoping to see more of that next year as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think that we really caught the timing of the neural audio programmer, uh, neural audio plugin competition, really uh, on the bullseye there when we came out with it in uh, January and February. Uh, it coincided with that announcement of uh, OpenAI and the LLMs uh, coming out. And I don't know that our timing could have been any better there. <laughs> uh, and like you said, it's so interesting to me that as far back for me as my university days in 2016, 2017, we knew or everybody knew uh who was really on the ground level with the industry that these things did exist that isotope had been using machine learning already in their plugins and getting some great results and uh it's very interesting that once the llms came out that that just broke through this uh new um creative barrier that i think that we had in the industry um, one of the favorite things of this year that, uh, that I've seen is the, uh, acceleration of stems and stem separation technology and seeing that into a technology like Serato, which is one of the most widely used DJ applications. I mean, that has been something that I, as a DJ have been having dreams about for, for years and everybody just, and now it's possible, um, and with that have also come some, uh, some ethical questions as well. So there's some news that I'm not sure that you're aware of, but uh, Serato can actually, actually has uh, access to some streaming services. So you can actually, if you're a subscriber to Tidal, uh, for example, that you can actually uh, access Tidal's music through Serato. But recently, uh, a new development has broken out where Tidal has prohibited use of STEM technology within um, within Serato. So if you're so if you're taking a song that is on Tidal and you want to play it, you actually aren't legally uh, able to use the STEM technology along with it, which is interesting. Uh, so there have been many concerns just around the ethical implications. And we've talked in the past about how companies uh, are actually training these models and what that holds. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, on where things are going to go from an ethical perspective? Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're seeing, um, yeah, a lot more attention being like paid to, to this sort of this, uh, the ethics now, which is something that was kind of, maybe glazed over um at the early sort of um period of of the AI research and stuff in audio because I guess maybe the yeah the quality wasn't there yet and uh, the the range of possibilities and use cases weren't there yet but it's definitely been more of a kind of screaming concern uh you know this year um and uh, I think uh you know there's been a lot of uh, companies that are starting to um you know as part of their uh, sort of message and um and and beliefs and things like that are kind of like uh i guess uh, stating that they are um supporting artists and like sort of being more transparent with like what they're doing to support artists and um i think that's been a big like quite a large um sort of a change uh, whereas in the past uh, and when all of these big technologies were coming out 
uh, companies were being like less transparent with, about how the data was being used. And um, I think we're now seeing uh, more transparency with the, the data being used. Not all companies and uh, some of the bigger companies, um, you know, are also um, partly to blame for not... Uh, <laughs> you know making as much uh movement in this uh area as, uh, as we could we could have made by this point if they were more uh transparent with the data but i think um yeah we're seeing more and more of that and more and more and more of the open sourcing and i think um when it comes to like uh sort of um you know benefiting uh the artists and producers producers that are kind of contributing to the models being uh being trained and the data sets are being used. I think there's seems to be more and more uh discussion and agreements between the artists and the companies uh, for use of their like more more and more permission, I would say, uh that's been granted, which is great to to see. Um it's sort of like uh, you can't really get away with uh not doing that now. I think um it can sort of send huge red flag flags. Um, to the the end user, if you're not if they're not saying that they're making agreements with the artists and uh, you know where they're uh, sourcing the data from, so um, so that's that's interesting. Uh, you know we're we're also seeing like some people like kind of um, you know, I suppose like um, be a bit more upfront with their opinions on on this whole sort of thing. Uh, I think uh, you know recently, um, the VP of uh, Ed Newton Rex from Stability, for example, um, you know, voiced his concern, uh, uh, you know, about the data usage uh, at Stable Audio, and sort of left um, his position there uh, due to how the data was being used. So I think um, you know a lot more people have been kind of outspoken. I think about. Uh, you know, data usage and, you know, lack of transparency and stuff like that. And I think um, more and more people will probably uh, sort of, I guess, um, yeah, make make these moves, which will then uh, trigger more and more companies having to, like, take action and, like, make sure that they're being transparent with their data usage uh, and things. So I think we'll see, see more and more of the, yeah, um, I guess like legislation coming in into, into play that will benefit artists um that haven't this that's I guess been a sort of gray area up until this point and still still is hugely but I think it's improving um but yeah Christian what's your what's your thoughts on that yeah definitely I mean I think this is also maybe one of the it's like an emerging topic now in 2023 but will probably be a defining topic of 2024 if I had to guess um but it's still really difficult to see how it will play out. But I definitely agree with a lot of the points that you've made, Andrew. Like, I think one of them is this strategy that some players are taking now, which is, you know, positioning themselves in kind of a positive way with regards to the data licensing, right? Um, since there kind of isn't any like actual legal groundwork yet to like say whether or not it's legal or not to train on copyrighted music, a lot of players are taking the approach of, you know, we're going to try to make some effort to license um, data in a way that we think follows some uh, fair approach. So like, I think two common ones to mention there, I think, so like while Ed did leave um, his position at Stability because of the data usage, it wasn't because of what they were doing with Stable Audio, it was because of, um, from my understanding, uh, Stability as a company's policy around data usage in other modalities. So the stuff that they built with um, Stable Audio was actually trained fully on licensed audio from this library called audio sparks which is like a stock music library so they they um did two things there one which is like have some licensing deal to get the data for training um, but then they also i think believe are also paying royalties to the people that created that content within inside the library as well um so there's some uh, revenue share that goes on between stable audio um, and the and the artist which is another approach beyond just licensing that is kind of being there um but i think the bigger concern there is around like other modalities like image and text. Currently, there is far less kind of uh, movement from players to respect existing copyright. And so, for example, someone like OpenAI has openly stated that you know their their kind of legal stance is to take a fair use approach to all of this. So you know 
they want to use that to defend kind of all of their rights to, for example, train on te text that's on the internet. Um, and stability, I think, is in a similar boat when it comes to their language modeling and image generation uh, models, which definitely, you know, for anyone that comes from a creative background can see how that could be problematic for creators. So, so yeah, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of movement on this. And I think there's a fundamental question, which is, you know, how will that play out? Like, will the fair use actually stand up in the long term and maybe artists kind of get the short end of the stick? Or will licensing actually play an important part long term for people in the music generation space? And I think that's the, the you know, the game that some people are playing now to try to figure out. Um, because I think in, in the licensing um, aspect, like you were mentioning, Andrew, I think the other big aspect is just kind of the optics of it, right? With when it comes to um, the music industry. So if if there is this aspect of like really good data being behind some closed wall that let's say only labels or artists have access to, we know that having that data is really important to build like the best and most competitive models. So if the people that end up winning are going to need access to that data, then potentially those data rights holders are in a really powerful position and they have to decide, well, who do we want to work with? Right. And so maybe they want to work with people that have previously respected the rights of artists in their eyes versus people that just really nearly trained on things, even though it was maybe legally allowed. Um, so I think that will be um, really interesting to see. But I think if I look forward, I, I I definitely see that both could play out. Like it's possible that fair use argument holds up and then that there might be some ruling there that like then opens up the floodgates of people training data on this data, like models on any kind of data. Um, but I feel like also for the, even if the licensing deposition goes forward, there's a big question to me if there's actually a sustainable business model there. Like maybe that's like what ethically feels right to a lot of creators, but when I also look to just, let's say, music streaming business model in general, like ignoring all of AI, or even questioning whether that model itself makes sense and is sustainable for someone like Spotify, for example. And so I wonder if you add on top of that, just also this other business, which is like, we want to train on a bunch of music and generate more music that could potentially take away market share in this existing business. Is that actually going to make it even harder for streaming services? And if there's no streaming service, how are you going to make money? you know, licensing data and things like that. So that's still really all up in the air. Yeah, that's interesting because from, so my my prediction on this is that they will probably, my prediction, and I'm happy to stand on this if, uh, if I got proven wrong, is that there are too many companies that have too much money, too much power to let fair use uh, move forward in, in that type of way. Uh, that means that, opportunities for businesses like let's say universal to uh to make licensing revenue off of uh, data from their movies from their from from their music is just going to be uh is just going to be lost can't see uh can't see how a court is not going to rule uh that fair use is going to uh be okay for for ip like that and then like you said, if it if it's the business if it's a licensing model that moves forward, how does that how does that compute into business models? Does that mean that anybody's actually even going to be able to make any money off of this? Uh, it's very interesting because companies like OpenAI, there, if if it becomes uh, a licensing model that that moves forward, does that mean that OpenAI may be finished? Uh, because they're not going to be able, going to be able to use the models that they've that they've trained. Um, yeah, very uh, very interesting uh, space at the moment. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, on? I'm I'm curious about how data for uh, Gemini has been trained. I mean, where does so that's Google's new model that uh, that works with text, audio, images, and video. I'm wondering, I haven't looked into this, if their data has been trained on just the internet's data, the the, um, the data that that we've given it as users of of, uh, of Google, of Google, I mean, I use Google Workspace in my, uh, for my company. Um, what are your thoughts on that, uh, on, on that breakthrough? Because it sounds. Uh, I, I saw the uh, the video, the keynote on it, and it looked amazing. But then I also saw that an article had come out a day later that said that a lot of it had been 
uh, faked that, maybe not faked, but just uh, played up uh, in a way that was exaggerated and that it wasn't, you know, we saw the interaction between the user and the, uh, and, and a voice that was responding. So uh, my understanding is that this was actually a text conversation, not an actual voice conversation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think was it with Gemini they they also like announced like different tiers of like versions like si like model sizes, which is kind of interesting because um, yeah, I think I, I don't know if this is the case yet or will be the case, but I feel like maybe the they'll be more likely to kind of uh you know release or deploy like the the smaller scale uh, versions first before. Maybe to, um, and keeping a lot, the larger train models kind of like, you know, um, what's used the, to train them like kind of in internal. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, not that might not be the, the case of what happens, but I guess it's much easier to to release things about this and uh, the smaller models and know what's, you know, and sort of be a bit more transparent about like the data that's been used to train those. Um, so I guess they're, yeah, they're planning to sort of. Because I think the idea is like the smaller models can run on the consumer machine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that'll be interesting to see how they sort of deliver that in regards to like, um, yeah, talking about uh, what's what's been used to train the models and things like that. Um, the larger models, yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's not really, it's not really been um, publicly um stated yeah what, what they've been using to train uh, for those results that we've seen in the keynote for example um yeah so i'm not sure how they're going to move forward with that <laughs> it'll be interesting to see and see yeah. like you know what might be the uh repercussions or the you know the re the reaction to it but um yeah i don't know that's, that's just my thoughts on it just so far it seems kind of um still a bit uh, ambiguous maybe and regarding that like what's going to how they're going to sort of action on things and you know what's going to be the the result and response to that um yeah i don't know christian do you know do you know any more on that Bef before yeah. Christian starts, i was gonna i was just gonna interject because it made me think of a couple things one of which was that uh i'm not sure if you saw the benchmarks from from the video mm. yeah i kind of expected the benchmarks to be a little bit more of an improvement on what OpenAI has already done. So it surprised me that the benchmarks were still quite close to OpenAI's results. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that I was thinking of was just looking at, I was, I was watching the video and I'm very curious as two people for two people whose profession is actually centralized in AI, which of us on this was, that I was looking at this and I was just thinking, what are the business implications of this? What are the what are the product implications of this? Because I wasn't really it it wasn't really coming to me. And I was thinking, am I missing something? Because you know, you put a notepad on a table and it's like, and the and the you know, the AI responds, this is a notepad on the table. Wow, looks like you draw a curved line. Oh wow, it looks like a duck. Uh, and I'm and I'm thinking, what does this mean in terms of products? Because it's not really. I mean, in terms of what we, uh, the under of, of what we perceive of the uh, of the model's understanding is impressive. But in terms of how am I going to practically use this every day? What does this mean for me in terms of the? How is it going to change my life? How is it going to revolutionize my life? didn't really apparently come to me maybe kids kids games i could see uh uh but in terms of um the bigger picture of what it meant for products being built on top of this it hasn't become apparent to me and i'm wondering some of i i, I kind of turned a critical eye towards and i thought you know are we looking at something that in its um <clears throat> that looks impressive in its particular context, but for wider use, 
may not have as many uses. What do you think about that? Or is am I just seeing it all wrong and that there are massive implications of where this is going? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel your sentiment on that when you look at the demos of the systems. And maybe that's actually a pretty good criticism of their marketing strategy, but I make me, I don't know what their bigger game is, but I do have an answer to your doubts, I guess, because for me, what I've seen and what I believe to be the real potential value add of these kinds of very powerful general, like general purpose foundation model that's multimodal is essentially it would be the next generation of software development. So it's really integrating this thing as one building block within a larger existing software ecosystem. Um, and another way to say that is kind of like what I call, and I didn't invent the name, but like what people call AI agents essentially. And so that's the idea where it's not so much just this text box where you ask it a question, like the chatbot kind of thing. It's more like where you have some existing software in infrastructure with databases and UI, UX, and uh, things that are communicating and make, having to make decisions in some over time. And the AI agent is, for example, a language model that can take as input multiple different things like images and text and make a decision, which, for example, involves calling APIs and endpoints that already exist, getting information and collecting it. So I've seen some pretty cool demos of these kinds of people building AI agents, which is basically something like uh, GPT-3 or 0.5 or 3.4, or 4, where you kind of ask it to, for example, research a topic like, I would like to find out more about these startups and what they're funding and what rounds they've, how much money they've raised, and then and and like create a report for me. And then you give, for example, something like GPT-4 the ability to search the internet, and it can then it can, for example, first it, it might first create a step like, okay, create some queries for Google that would be relevant for this, and then it can go execute each of those queries, read the text from the resulting pages, and then organize that and, for example, create an Excel spreadsheet that has listed those things and a bunch of information you asked it to do. But it can do this in a recursive fashion because it might, for example, find some information on one page where it's like, oh, this particular investor invested in that company. So maybe I want to go make a new query that queries about that investor, for example. And so you can see how this kind of creates a like a web of possible actions that these things can take that don't need to be predefined by a human. And that can be really powerful. So but for example, none of that is included like in the demo of Google Jetpack, right? So you wouldn't see that behavior based on what they've demoed. But I think what they're assuming that you know is like, okay, if you have a thing that has these capabilities of like, can recognize arbitrary images and, and talk about it in text, as well as take complex uh, logic problem and try to solve that, how that could be useful in a lot of workflow that humans are already doing day to day in their jobs, potentially. Mm, yeah, that's that's interesting. So, so what you're saying is that, um, it becomes a much more rich interaction rather than uh, a search box. Uh, so, so you have the search box, which is kind of your first iteration of, I have a question, give me some, you know, give me the websites that have the answer to this and becomes more of a comprehensive, cohesive type of workflow. So yeah, I, I can see some of that. And like you were saying, some of the examples that they were, that, that they were showing in the demonstration, uh, you know, made me think, well, you know, that's a, that's all right. But the, there was one where it was, I'm planning a party, I'm planning a party for my kid. Um, and it came up and it, and it developed this, I think it was like a web page or a PDF that, that, was, that was interactive that had all of these graphics, all of these different things. I don't know. I'm like on one side, I'm thinking that's really cool. And that could be really interesting, especially if you're doing a research project. I like, I like what you were saying about a research project being one where you say, okay, I want to know about the history of India from 1100 to 1400. And it's pulling in all of these different uh, pieces of information. Um, you know, then it's combining them in a way that's, much richer and more interactive. Um, I'm, I'm still a little bit skeptical. I'm still a little bit like, I just want, just give me a link to, um, you know, encyclopedia that <laughs> give me a couple links and I combine that data. So maybe it's just that I'm not 
in that generation that, you know, maybe it's this next generation that's not going to be thinking about doing things so manually. Like I would want, I would pull together different, those different websites, grab a list of them, and then I would manually combine them and sift through them and combine them in my own way. And it sounds like this is maybe starting to think about automating some of those processes. Am I, am I right in, in saying that? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think it would be good to think beyond just search application. Like I, that's kind of the applic application I gave, but I was also hinting at like, just you could imagine all possible enterprise user case use cases, like wherever there's like a database and information needs to be queried or added in a dynamic way, like where a human needs to decide like what should happen if this thing happens, that's where these things can be really powerful because then you can have models that like, for example, someone, maybe some user is trying to get some sort of information from the database, but to do that, get that information, they need to like create a SQL query and they need to know which database to go to and all this like generally kind of hard stuff to do that someone needs to be trained. In theory, one of these models, you could expose that UI to someone that knows nothing about databases or about SQL and just says, I wanna know how many people in the database meet these criteria. And then it can actually write a SQL query for you, for example, and like know which databases and maybe that, and then maybe you can kind of imagine how to chain that because maybe they want to find some sort of information, but then they want to do something complex, like create a new database, a new table in the database that also captures this new information that's coming in, you know, in different ways. And you wouldn't need to have, you know, a dedicated database engineer potentially to do that in the future. And this could be more automated. It could happen just because a user goes onto a website and tries to do something, for example. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on Gemini uh, in general from your perspective, and then and then the next question that I was thinking about is just thinking about how this applies to music creation and to what we do with audio. Because, uh, well, let's get to that after you give your thoughts about Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was I was going to touch on that actually, just uh, when you guys were uh, sort of discussing that, um, was just like the how this sort of multi multi modality kind of type system will be um will impact i guess like music creation and sort of a music production for example like you know i was trying to imagine what it it would eventually or pot potentially be like interacting with a sort of multimodal system to write music and whether that's something that people would be interested in or some some you know in some use cases uh, some people might want to to work like that. You know, imagine. I mean, I'm trying to think. Like, imagine you were sitting in the studio with a, with like the best or one of the best like, uh, sound engineers. You know, obviously that's sub subjective, but like that a really talented uh, sound engineer. Um, and you could just like feed them, sort of ideas whether, <laughs> whether you were like singing something, a melody, or like something you did sort of noodle something on like the piano and then they could like transform that into something like that sounds sounds great it has all the as far as the mixing is concerned like everything sounds good um you know to the ear balance like the frequencies are all eq'd and mastered and all this sort of that sort of thing like but i wonder what that dialogue would be like you know because i think um you know the way we describe sound is very um there's not like always a clear definition for like how we describe sound in different ways so it'll be interesting to sort of uh i guess like when once we're at that point sort of interacting and having this sort of dialogue with a sort of multimodal um ai system where you're sort of describing things and it does something and you go no no that's not quite right try more like this and and seeing how that that system actually interprets what you say and what you feed it to provide a new like a uh, result and you know, also I wonder whether like if because it's multimodal, um, we'll interact with it in sort of various different ways. For example, like um, obviously right now we do the sort of text and music generation, and um, there's a few systems that do like image to music generation. Um, I think I'm I'm interested in like how we steer, uh, these models into like how. Uh, to get a certain result so i think a combination of like different uh, modalities might be one interesting direction to be more expressive so like whether it's like um you know feeding it 
feed, feeding the the AI some some video footage, but also giving it like, but also speaking to it and saying like, I'm kind of looking for something that like that with this vibe and you know music that suits this um kind of aesthetic and you know I I interpret it this way like um so something along those lines and then it feeds back some result and then you kind of tweak it either by you know speaking to the system or feeding it some other material um but yeah i'm curious whether that's something that you know will be interesting or like people will want to work with when it comes to like music production or whether there'll be a separation and i think realistically there will be a separation and like some people will work with like these models these agents you know it's like a kind of co-producer but like um you know uh outputs recent um <laughs> The name of outputs recent uh uh service with the co you know co-producer kind of idea but um but like a like more like a literal co co-producer um so it's an ai agent that you sort of interact with whether that'll be an interesting way of working or whether you know musicians and producers still want to find sort of tools that they have a, a, a greater sense of like control over and like mastery of i think that's what a sort of interesting thing to think about is like whether as a creator, we kind of want to have tools that we feel like we kind of are, are aiming for some sort of mastery over in some way. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's just my thoughts at the moment is that, you know, time will tell, I think, um, what happens. But um, I yeah, think, I think there are going to be challenges. I mean, I can't speak for other music producers, but for me, normally when I think when I think of a piano, for instance, I might say something like, I want the piano sound of uh of this that Calvin Harris used on this particular on this particular track. That would normally be the reference that I would draw from. Now, if not if I'm not able to do that, I think that that's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky for creators to be able, because I would imagine that other creators would kind of base their foundation from what they've heard before, you know, where they say, okay, I want an 808. Okay. It'd be great to have an 808 that was, that sounded like this particular song from this particular artist. And if we're, yeah, you know, how is that going to work? I think, I think it's going to be interesting because, you know, one way if they do go with the business, uh, business style, um, license licensing style um models uh licensing models um as the legal way to do this in the future um does that mean that it'll be a little bit like what we see with video streaming services where to get access to certain data to get access to uh, the data from certain artists or from certain songs then you have to have the universal the universal music model if you want to get access to data from that universal artist or um that because uh, i because i think that's going to be it's going to be very tricky uh in the future what do you think christian yeah i mean 100 percent. i i well i think that's definitely true to some degree like where the data comes from is going to be important um so i think that in some sense the like you're saying like the limitation in some sense actually this licensing challenge is going to it could very well end up limiting the progress of these models basically that's the other way of looking at it so it might end up being worse for consumers right? because now you have this thing of like yeah i need to get the model that was i have to pay some amount of money to get the pack of data that was trained on this data set that i want or these kinds of artists um, and that very well could happen. And maybe that's a way to have a sustainable business model for the rights holders, but for users, like it's actually much worse. It's kind of like the problem of like, if I want to watch my favorite shows, but one's on Netflix and one's on, you know, Hulu or whatever, I have to pay for the service of all of them. Right. Instead of like where currently, like with music streaming, you can generally have one platform that hosts all of that. Um, so I worry that that could be a concern around, around. like maybe we actually have the AI tech to build a great model but we can't actually build it because of the licensing constraints and but to your point of like you know i want to make a piano that sounds like this the piano on this track 100 percent, we will definitely have that ability um and i think the multimodality for music models is where that is going to come from um we're not really there yet but it's kind of happening slowly the music 
generation models now are still kind of relatively constrained and that it's usually just text conditioning to music generation. Um, but like the newer models are doing things like melody conditioning as well. Um, and I really think just scaling the conditioning and like the modalities that are to use to train that model is really the key moving forward. And that really looks something like essentially what you would call like music foundation model. Um, so like some giant model that's trained on as much data with as much modalities as possible. So it would include really detailed, not only music, but maybe like music reviews, like just a bunch of text that's relevant, that has relevant information about how different artists and different songs are related to each other. You know, what, how a music producer would think about it, right? Because when they're thinking about a certain sound, they're actually thinking about like all the songs they know and the history of how different artists have collaborated or created different sounds and how the technology, like you mentioned, 808, like how that relates and stuff too. So I really think these models would need to have that kind of knowledge in order to start really becoming um, powerful. But it also, I wanted to tie that back also to an earlier point that uh, we made, because I think there's kind of one fundamental question when it comes to like the players that are building these kinds of models, like what that's going to look like in the future. Because one strategy is just this kind of foundation model approach, like keep building a bigger, bigger model, which is basically like GPT-4 and Gemini kind of approach. And in some sense, they might even want to, you know, encapsulate music as a subdomain of their giant model, right? And so maybe you don't even need a music specialized model. Maybe Gemini actually could be that thing that is your music AI co-pilot in theory, um, because it has all the modalities, it's been trained on a bunch of data and it could be really good at that. Um, but there might be practical constraints to that. For example, it's just too expensive to use that giant model for music production. So then there's like this question of maybe the better option is to build more specialized models. So like maybe a music only model, but it could even be more specific than that. Like should there be one giant model that does everything for audio? Like, for example, it can generate audio, but it can also create mixes. It can remove noise. It can do stem separation. Could that just be one giant model that's actually better because it does everything uh, as opposed to having specialized models? And that for me is like a fundamental question, I think both in the research and in the product side that we don't really know the answer to yet. And I think we'll see that unfold, but it's really interesting to me because everyone kind of has to hedge their bets now on like what they think that's going to be because if these foundation models end up being way 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 better than anything you can build with a specialized model then those specialized models will you know not survive the long, in the long run mm. i think that's also it's interesting because like it uh, that almost follows like what we see in the, the plug-in landscape right where it's not like it's not like someone's built a door and then the door can do everything to to what you you know You'd like you'd like that. That's why the the plugins became a thing. Like sort of, they have their own quirks and characteristics, and they do things differently, and they all have their own uh, sort of behavior. And and um, you know, this one one uh, plugin might be better at doing this thing, and you know, another plugin might be better at, like doing this. And I think um, yeah, and there's, and saying that, there's not also there, there are plugins that, that sort of come out that can do a, like a lot, like a jack of all trades, but then. You know they have their set purpose, and it's not like someone depends purely on, on that that one plugin for everything. So so maybe that will we'll see a similar, like phenomenon in in the in the sort of the AI model, sort of um, landscape as well, where sort of there's these massive models that can kind of do something quite well, but you know it's the specialist models that people flock to because they do something really well, and um, yeah, for for a very particular task. So that could be also one direction that, and I think it's quite a realistic direction uh, initially anyway. You know, like you said, um, Christian, like, uh, it, you know, there could be the potential outcome that these massive models like just swallow <laughs> all this, the more specialist um, uh, and specific models. But um, I think in the short term anyway, I think there's, there'll definitely be room or a lot of like very like smaller and more uh, specialist models uh, as well as the the sort of larger models um so yeah yeah another another difference between the streaming video streaming models and the way that maybe this audio music creation model could potentially work together is that streaming models are when you have a movie that's not on Netflix, but maybe it's on Hulu or Amazon. It's just as simple as going over to that service and you go and you grab that movie and now you're a satisfied customer. So it's just paying for those two separate services to ensure that you have coverage across those. Where, whereas with music creation, the creator is going to want to have access to all 
of those things. You know, so is does it become a question of how do we bring different models or different interactions into a centralized system where these things can coincide with each other or, or interact with each other in ways? So you have your universal model, universal music model that you're bringing in because you need because you want access to the data from a certain artist that's on Universal, but then you have this other model because you want to have access to, let's say Sony, somebody from Sony, and but that it comes into a centralized system that is able to create um, new interactions. You know, it also made me think about <clears throat> that there's the separation between the data itself and the models that train it for a purpose, right? So it's it's almost like, uh, does that mean that people will be creating their custom models in the future that maybe, maybe a user or maybe a company would have access to, uh, to license data almost the way that we do with sample packs uh, and that you're able to bring it into, and maybe you have other people that they have certain, um, <clears throat> maybe a STEM separation you know, stem separation model, but it, but it's just an empty shell. It doesn't actually have any um, data that it's been trained on. It's just a model that's built, <clears throat> pardon me, for the purpose of stem separation. And that you're actually inputting the data into this model, but that the consumer or the company is actually creating their own model based off of that. I don't know. I'm thinking outside the box here, but... What do you what do you think of that? Does that sound crazy or non not, not realistic or well, I think the first like technological blocker is that like to get a good model, you basically want as much data as possible. So I feel like the real harm to the consumer if rights holders don't want to share the data is that if you do have this model where it's like, okay, there's the universal model, the Sony model, both of those models will be weaker than one model trained on both, basically. Mm -hmm. um, right. So it seems more likely that this will play out at the kind of like business or company level so that each company will be like, we want to provide the best model to our users. So we need to negotiate data rights with all as many rights holders as possible so that we can collect as much data as possible and then train on that and provide a model. Now, how the monetization like goes from like those rights holders to the companies to the users, I think is what's undefined. But it seems really like it would be a huge limitation to say like, yeah, only this model can be trained on that data and this model can be trained on that separate data because those independent models will be weaker than one model trained on, on both. And really what we would want to build any of these really powerful systems is one model that's yeah, trained on the entirety of all recorded music and history, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, going back to the output uh, pack pack generator, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, seems like is uh, i haven't had a chance to experiment with it but um with that one in splices uh splices create does this mean that this is the end for sample packs because this is this seems like a great battleground of okay now we have models that are generating sample pack content uh is it better or is it even on the same level as uh what we're seeing curated from um from from creators and producers what are your thoughts on that so yeah i mean is it the end of uh for sample packs i think i think maybe following this paradigm like we're seeing like um a repurposing of sample packs right because sample packs are actually in this sort of when you look at it in this way it's kind of like really it's like high quality data it's like data sets for for these kind of models and um so Obviously, sample packs um, are used extensively uh, for you know as instruments and, and various different purposes right now. But we are we are seeing this sort of the uh, emergence of these um, I guess like uh, neural neural audio instruments and, uh, and and synthesizers that potentially offer more uh, gr like granular control of of the material that's um, that's produced. And um, I think the thing is that we we in order to to achieve that and and to have these tools that can do that you, we also need the sample pack sort of high quality data to to also train the model so i think um you know we're seeing from like splice and um 
and and output them sort of leveraging the high quality data that they have access to and and you know and uh, the licensing to um to train these models so i think it, it opens up another dimension for for what the their services can can offer um you know whether output outputs arcade will like include um the co-producer kind of a uh, uh, functionality at some point, whether you know generating samples, um, as uh, you know b- being able to uh, generate your own instrument, um, essentially te- you know text prompt, create some some samples, and then create your own um, sort of playable instrument. Whether that be something the direction they go with it, or um, I think at the moment it's mainly uh, it's like a kind of web uh, front end right now where you can just you know you do the text prompt, you generate the the samples, and uh, you can use them how you want, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to see whether they build that functionality into maybe arcade or something like that to sort of complement uh, and extend what they already have um, there. Um, I think that one of the greatest things from I've only had a quick um, play with the with the service, but one of the interesting things is that it provides variations and options. So you know you can give it uh, some text and. Um, it doesn't just generate like one thing; it generates a whole range of things, and that is, uh, I think, as a you know music producer, musician, that's quite powerful. Of being able to rapidly audition um, material and rapidly curate. And I think um, uh, that's what what we also saw and currently see with um, uh, splices uh, create stuff is like it's trying to um, streamline um, that sort of curation. Uh, uh, process and you know be able to like find uh, sounds that go well together uh, quickly and be able to addition different sounds uh, really quickly um, and you know I think text is is potentially quite a useful uh, modality to maybe steer um, you know from a huge uh, I guess uh, pool of material like being able to to steer like into like areas with you know, you're interested in like the the audio and stuff like that. I think text is quite useful, maybe for that. So, um, so yeah. So I think I think it's an interesting direction. Um, I am interested more so in like how, uh, it's it sort of scales beyond what's what's there right now. Um, and how it's packaged and and sort of, um, presented. Uh, out with the sort of web website web service domain. Uh. I think, uh, yeah, we'll see. It may be included in Arcade. That's my prediction. We'll see if that's the case. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think it'll be interesting to see, um, yeah, how that sort of is brought into the ecosystem that Output have already established. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and and also how it affects uh, sample pack creators and people who would normally be licensing this to these companies. Um you know, does it mean that they're going to start that this is going to start taking hold uh, and becoming the way that creators start uh, curating their own sample packs and curating their own sounds rather than uh, rather than companies coming from the outside looking for creators to give them source material that that people can buy. Very interesting. Um, Seems like a good time to start wrapping up. Uh, any parting thoughts for 2023 leading into 2024? So we talked a little bit about ethics. Ethics is our, uh, we, we think that that will definitely be a, uh, a battleground and a theme for 2024. Uh, what else are we, are we predicting for next year for AI and audio? So I think, uh, yeah, at the moment, like we were talking about, it's a bit of a, a wild west um, when it comes to the legislation and the ethics. I think, yeah, we'll start to see more of a of that being re- reined in uh, a little. I think next year, like more, um, a bit more of a grapple on on I think how to 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 move forward and for companies uh, how to sort of operate um, when it comes to like uh, you know um, copyright and things like that. So. We'll hopefully see more of that next next year which is you know my hope anyway that um you know we start to to sort of uh converge on, on certain things next year like that the ethics um 
I think also next year we might have more surprises in store <laughs> that, that sort of uh, make it difficult again to sort of uh, figure out what the, you know, ethically how to, to, to handle certain things and, you know, let it sort of throw a spanner in the works again for legislation. Um, uh, so w I wonder what that will look like, I guess. Um, but new, I guess new technologies, new, new uh, modalities. Um, I think, yeah, hopefully we'll see a, uh, interesting uh sort of you know kind of types of tools being used in interesting ways um uh, like start to emerge again maybe this year's been a lot of the text to music like maybe next year will be other sort of modalities that will get the highlight so yeah we'll just have to wait and see yeah also we'll we'll start getting the first feedback as well in terms of how what customer trends are going to look like as well uh, with sound with outputs uh, kit generator, for instance, does that change? Is that going to change the way that um, is that going to change what customers want or will they get more involved in this and start feeling that they're now serving almost as a creator and curator themselves, or does it mean, or will, will they reject this and, say and and trend back towards uh pack, sound packs and material from other prolific music producers uh, so very curious to see what that looks like because one thing that i could say is looking at some of the comments when uh when companies have been coming out with um, products that seem to do um, ai or um uh, that seem to generate uh, generate riffs, generate um, generate sound packs. Uh, that there has been a considerable negative backlash as well that has happened of, of uh, that I've seen from customers of how about we just go back to being creative again and creating our own riffs, creating our, you know rather than relying too much on uh, on models to generate those for us. So curious to see what customer sentiment is going to be in 2024 uh how about yourself christian what do you what do you predict for 2024 yeah i think the other i mean it's one i think the big thing is music generation being improved like just seeing that scaling seeing more players in the game people looking at what's the ui ux for the models that already exist as well as pushing yeah what's the boundary for what's next with these models what what can we do with them more kinds of conditioning getting more training data, scaling up the size of the models. I think that will be um, definitely there on the music gen side. As we talked about before, I think the other end of stuff is kind of on the real-time plugin space will also keep developing. I think that tends to move a bit slower than these other um, aspects, but um, I think we'll continue to see that more plugins coming out with actual machine learning models running inside the plugin in real-time contexts, um, or even just people building wrappers around existing like web server or API services that are then going to get more and more connected with DAWs as we move forward. Um, yeah, I think it's exciting, exciting time. So I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, I mean, it's also been great to have these discussions this year so far. And yeah, I wanted to say thanks to everyone that's listened in uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks to everybody who's uh, who's been uh, listening to the podcast and been uh, supporting everything that we've done here so far. Uh, we hope that we can enhance that as well in the future. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have much more news to come uh, here in the following year. There's there's a lot happening in this space and we're excited uh, to see where, where it turns. Um, with that, I think it's a good time for us to sign off. Uh, happy holidays to everybody. Um, and happy new year. And uh, we will see you in January. Uh, see if any breaking news comes out in between uh, in the next month. And um, yeah, have a great holiday. Have a safe holiday. Uh, stay safe out there and see you again next month.